In the pre-dawn hours of June 14, 1971, a red brick house on 1970 Hazelwood Street became the stage for a harrowing crime. At precisely 4.30 a.m., the living room in one of the building's apartments rang out with echoes of gunfire. The policemen from the 10th Precinct got urgent calls from neighbors between 12th and 14th Street as they reported the gunshots. Meanwhile, the wife of a certain Robert Gardner dialed the police, sharing a horrifying discovery that she had found her husband wounded and dying. She rushed him to the Henry Ford Hospital and urgently pleaded, There is a bloodbath in that house, and you better send some police. Upon the cops' arrival, they found a slaughter in that apartment. Seven lives were quashed in what was now the scene of the largest mass murder Detroit PD had ever seen. Real quick, remember to hit that bell button, subscribe and comment if you like the content. It really helps. Thank you. The victims would be identified as Catherine Louise Winston, age 19, Narcissa Lee Brown, age 19, Catherine Betty Basser, age 22, Sharon Brown, age 20, Romando Burton, age 24, Carl Carrington Mounts Jr., age 27, and Lloyd Kenneth Tyler, age 27. They were all now silent witnesses to the brutality that had unfolded in that living room that early morning. Upon further investigation of the crime scene, the police established that all the victims were shot in the head at point-blank range. Also, all victims were of African-American descent. Scattered on the ground, they found cartridges from three different guns, a 30 caliber carbine, a 32 caliber pistol, and a 45 caliber automatic. The bodies were sprawled across the room, and their positions revealed a narrative of their final moments. Once seated on the floor, two men were found lying with their heads resting in the fireplace. Three women were on the couch, and one was on the floor nearby. Mysteriously, the three women had their hands bound with rubber surgical tubing, with one holding the waist of another. The eighth victim, Robert Gardner, lay dead from shots to the mouth, chest, and stomach. It appeared that after being shot, he had fallen ten feet from the front door. The place theorized he was the first to be shot as he answered the door and was hit almost instantly. He was rushed to Henry Ford Hospital, where never having regained consciousness, he succumbed to his wounds on June 20th, six days later. Each body was a tragic piece in this grim puzzle. James Bannon, the District Inspector of the Detroit Homicide Bureau, led a team of 20 detectives in the investigation of the case. They found that the crime scene bore no signs of a struggle or any indication that the victims had attempted to escape. And although there initially seemed to be no witnesses to the incident, it all changed when three individuals who escaped the massacre sought refuge and assistance at the police headquarters. Among them were two women and a man, all of whom escaped by breaking through the rear window of the sun porch, followed by a spirited run down an alley. As the detectives investigated the house, they found the rooms had minimal furniture and water had splashed onto the floor from a bullet that struck a waterbed when the killers fired at Mr. Gardner. A more thorough search revealed five handguns and five long guns, including a sawed-off shotgun. None of these firearms bore recent traces of discharge. They also found a collection of heroin paraphernalia, spoons, tin foil, hypodermic needles, and several small packets suspected to contain heroin. Although the retrieved items helped to make some hypotheses, the neighbors' observations about the activities within the house drew a clearer picture. That morning, four men had been seen fleeing the crime scene. Allegedly, they were oddly dressed in windbreakers and Scottish Tam O'Shanter hats. Vera Gibson, a resident who lived in the apartment directly above the crime scene, became an unwitting witness. She reported to have heard the shattering of glass, 
which was the escape of the three survivors. Her senses heightened further as she heard Mrs. Gardner urgently running up the stairs, her voice carrying the shocking revelation that her husband had been shot. Desperate for assistance, she requested to use Mrs. Gibson's phone. The Gibsons, unfortunately, didn't own one. In the eyes of the Gibsons, the Gardners, described as a pleasant couple, had recently become part of the neighborhood fabric. Interviews with other neighbors added another layer to the narrative. They recounted observing several young folk frequenting the Gardner residence, coming and going under the cloak of night. A vigilant young patrolman stationed on the stoop, safeguarding the house, revealed another bit of information. He revealed that such houses, like the one he guarded, were often used as dope houses. What's more, these dope houses were often targets of stick-ups, a possible motive for the crime. Another young witness stepped forward, recounting instances where concerned locals had alerted the police, urging an investigation into the activities transpiring within the house in question. Nothing was ever done about it. This wasn't the first time this had happened. Historically, Detroit locals had complained many times before that their reports to the police about suspected drug activities in black neighborhoods often went unresolved. The signs of late night comings and goings, indicative of potential drug dens, became whispers in the shadows, unanswered by the forces meant to protect. In their defense, the police expressed the challenge of acting without concrete evidence, as entering these suspected dens had always been a risky job. Attempts to make undercover purchases carried the risk of a hostile reception with strangers often being greeted with the barrel of a shotgun. Complicating matters further, even if a dealer was arrested, posting bail would swiftly return them to the streets, resuming their illict trade within days. Bannon, who led the investigation of the apartment, suspected the victims to be felons. He revealed that four out of the seven had previous run-ins with the law, entangled in crimes related to narcotics and prostitution. Among them, Lloyd Tyler emerged as a figure with a troubled history, marked by multiple felony convictions. Tyler's criminal journey included a significant 1968 robbery of a jewelry store that escalated into the police. Notably, he battled heroin addiction and his legal obligations mandated entry into a federal narcotics treatment center in Kentucky as a probation condition. However, citing his antisocial behavior, the center rejected him. There was no doubt in Inspector Bannon's mind that the apartment was a drug den popular with local underworld figures. Shedding light on the perplexing nature of the case, he stated, there is no question of an execution-type slaying, but we do not know what the motive was. One theory presented by Inspector Bannon was rooted in a series of robberies targeting narcotics dens that plagued the city throughout the year. He described these locations as ideal victims due to their possession of both money and drugs, coupled with their reluctance to involve the police. However, the discovery of around $600 on Mr. Gardner and small amounts on the other victims raised skepticism about robbery being the primary motive. An alternative scenario proposed by Bannon painted a picture of a potential turf war among narcotics rings. He had highlighted the fragmented state of the narcotics trade in Detroit suggesting an ongoing struggle between various factions vying for control. Lastly, the police floated a theory suggesting a revenge plot tied to a deceitful transaction involving Robert Gardner. The conjecture held that an individual who potentially bought counterfeit heroin from Gardner sought retribution. They surmised that the seven other victims were uninvolved in the beef mere casualties of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
The revenge theory gained traction when investigators found a substance within the apartment initially believed to be heroin. However, subsequent analysis revealed it to be a concoction of milk, sugar, and quinine. Law enforcement now began pursuing leads suggesting that Gardner might have crossed some other drug dealers in the past. As it stood, the investigation had Robert Gardner as the primary target of the attack. The other victims, described as Gardner's associates, comprised three dealers and four prostitutes. The police proposed a theory of the victims being systematically eliminated as witnesses to Gardner's murder. Law enforcement also now had enough info to name Gardner and another individual, Gerald Williams, as middle rank heroin dealers. Gardner also happened to be a pimp. However, the unfolding story took another dark twist just four days after the massacre. Gerald Williams, implicated as a potential collaborator, was fatally shot six times at a motel on Detroit's west side. Police speculated that Williams may have orchestrated Gardner's setup, guiding the assailants to his location. Further suspicions arose that Williams might have been present during the Hazelwood massacre, leading to a subsequent elimination to silence him as a witness. As the investigation into the Hazelwood tragedy unfolded, a new connection emerged, leading detectives on a trail to Toronto, Canada. A specialized team of homicide detectives was dispatched to unravel the threads of this mysterious lead. Insiders later revealed a web of intrigue involving Gerald Williams and a heroin supply network spanning Toronto. Allegedly, Williams supplied heroin to Toronto dealers, but discord arose when the substance was found to be diluted. Robert Gardner stepped into the scene taking charge of supplying the Canadians. However, suspicions lingered that Gardner was also tampering with the product. The origins of this story were traced back to March when discontented Toronto dealers, displeased with the diluted heroin, started looking for a new supplier in Detroit. Gardner, aware of their intentions, planned a daring move. He kidnapped their representative from a taxi cab and used him as a pawn to access the motel room where the Toronto dealers were staying. Gardner and an accomplice reportedly robbed the dealers, escaping with a loot of 13,000 in cash, 4,000 in jewelry, and 3 to 4,000 in cocaine. Unexpectedly, rather than killing the men, Gardner released the dealers and their intermediary. Allegedly, in response, the Toronto dealers, nursing a vendetta, hired gunmen to eliminate Gardner. Sensing the impending threat, Gardner shifted his residence from 2635 Cortland to 95 Portage in Highland Park, a location reportedly used by two other victims, Lloyd Tyler and Romando Burton, for heroin distribution under Gardner's wing. Eager to stay one step ahead, Gardner then relocated to the Hazelwood apartment. The running and hiding continued, with Gardner even venturing to New York City. However, a planned phone call from Gerald Williams, enticing Gardner with a potentially lucrative drug deal, lured him back to Detroit, where he was planned to meet his end. All in all, the case wound up sounding like something out of a movie plot a black dealer and pimp swindles some Canadian gangsters, then unwisely robs them and releases them after, spends the last few months of his life looking over his shoulder, then dies along with seven others by the guns of some men in Scottish hats. Sadly for the victims, not much more progress was made in the case. To this day, no arrests have ever been made and the case remains open. Aside from being the biggest unsolved mass shooting in U.S. history, the Hazelwood Massacre was and still is the most significant mass slaying in Detroit. 
It unfolded in the backdrop of a record-breaking year for murders in 1971, with 690 lives lost. The most brutal highlight of the deadliest decade in Detroit. A decade that earned Detroit a moniker that still lingers to this day. Murder City.